I've always been fascinated by computers um, throughout my life. I grew up really interested in computing, and it, it drove me to engineering school, where I wanted to learn how computers work, how do you build computers, how do, how do they process. And one of the classes that I had in school was called Computer Vision. It was a really good class. We worked with computers, interfacing them to the real world through cameras, bringing in images, and, and learning to process those images. And one of the assignments that we had was to do recognition of numbers, handwritten numbers, uh, the numbers 0 through 9. So we had index cards, and we wrote numbers on individual index cards, and then used cameras to process that and, and recognize those images through algorithms that we were to develop. And I wrote my number eight, and I, I remember my number eight. It was a beautiful eight, I think you would all agree. And I, I took a lot of care and effort into to crafting my circles and, and then working on algorithms that would look at the area of those circles and how the circles aligned and to really tell that that was the number eight. And I felt pretty good about that. And then the day of uh, the presentation of my assignment came, my professor came in and I dutifully handed over my index cards ready to, to be graded. And I remember my professor taking index cards and tossing them and then pulling out a different set. And you know that feeling that sometimes you have when you, you know you're screwed? Well, I had it because this was the number eight that got put under the camera. And I immediately saw the fallacy in my algorithm in my mind. And once my process ran and told my professor that that was the number six, I, I realized I wasn't going to get a good grade on that, but I did learn a really good lesson. And I brought a lot of bias to what I thought the number eight looked like. And I developed a system to process that number eight based on the bias that I had. I didn't think about the variance in the different number eights that might exist as people write them in different ways. And that may seem like a, a trivial example. It's, it's just a number, and the number eight, and it's probably not too terribly offended. But this exists in other systems. Let me tell you about a system um, called Google Cloud Vision. It sounds very impressive. In fact, Google Cloud Vision, if you read the slug line on their website, they detect objects and faces, read printed and handwritten text, and build valuable metadata. Valuable metadata. So just last year, some people did an experiment with Google Cloud Vision, and you submit a photo, and Google will tell you what's in the photo. And this was the experiment that was done. So essentially the same picture. It's a hand holding, as it turns out, a monocular or a digital thermometer. One hand is dark skin, and that same image, the hand was shaded light. Both submitted to Google. It did a great job of coming back and saying that there was a hand in each photo with a high degree of confidence. But you can see that the dark skin hand, Google thought was holding a gun. And the light skin hand, it successfully identified as holding a digital thermometer or monocular. When Google became aware of that problem, they quickly fixed it, as you would hope they would do. And this is how they fixed it. They redacted the word gun from the return on the dark skin hand. And you see, it's not easy to fix a problem like that because the problem isn't a switch that you flip, that you turn off. The problem is in the engineering. It's systemic. It's baked into the algorithm. Now, I don't at all think that the engineers at Google were evil people. I don't think that they did this by malice. I think that this happens because they built their system and they probably did iterative testing based on the data that they had on hand, pun intended, because their hand probably looked a lot like my hand. And that might be what my algorithms would come back with in processing data. But this problem exists in other things too. This year has been an amazing year in a massive shift to online education. This has happened across the world. The pandemic has really driven us to accelerate what we do online. And to do that on scale, we absolutely need technology to be our friend, to help us, to assist in that uplift. So when you think about trying to simply proctor exams on scale, it's, it's nearly impossible without some type of assistance. Artificial intelligence to the rescue. So now teachers, professors can proctor exams online using automation and artificial intelligence to help do that. The problem is, as this happened throughout the year, we started to find that people with darker skin were disadvantaged by these systems. Different studies and reports 
But in some cases, facial recognition doesn't work as well with people with darker skin. They couldn't even gain access to the system to take their exam. Or in other cases, they were flagged for potential cheating at much higher rates than people with lighter skin. How, how does that happen? And so if we think about there's bias that I've talked to you about in handwriting recognition, in racial um, and skin tone, but what about other things? What about ethics and morality? Does bias creep in there through artificial intelligence? We, we currently have systems today that are making decisions, artificial intelligence decisions, that decide things like who gets a loan, who gets hired, who gets paroled. Artificial intelligence makes those decisions. Is bias in that decision-making process? And what about taking it even beyond that and we start to think about life and death decisions? Does artificial intelligence make life and death decisions? We'll take, for instance, self-driving cars. They do a pretty good job, and they certainly have crash and accident avoidance systems in there. But at some point, there might be a, a, an accident that comes up that's hard to just avoid, and it has to be the lesser of two evils. And that decision is made in an instant. The car's driving along at a high rate of speed. A child steps in front. The car can hit the child or swerve into the oncoming lane. It's got two choices. Who decides what choice? Is it the consumer's decision? They bought the car. Is it the insurance company's decision? Is it politicians that decide this? Who decides? Do we know? We should know. What about a military drone? It's now an autonomous attack drone, and its prime directive is to attack people that maybe have a gun. I hope they didn't use the Google Vision API to make that determination. But this isn't a new problem. We've dealt with the, the struggle between humanity and technology for a long time. Um, deep thinkers from years ago really, really considered this. Uh, I want to show you a quote from a pioneer in healthcare information systems written 35 years ago. If you go back with me, 35 years. And the point was made that it's, it's in the crucible of the individual that technology most forcefully confronts human values. It's what artificial intelligence is doing. It's confronting human values. It's making decisions on human values that we are imparting into the algorithms that do this. And it's really important because AI is doing more and more. It's making more important decisions. It's making ethical decisions. It's making life and death decisions and it's making decisions that we must be intentional about addressing the bias in these systems. You know, it's been said that those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I would say that if we don't learn and explore the future of artificial intelligence, then we might just be doomed to. Thank you.